Now would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for the reading of God's Word. Now, and, and to slip down if you would to verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, our, your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Then, at His coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when He delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of our God abides forever by his grace and mercy May his word be preached for you. Please be seated. I'm going to ask you to keep your Bibles open there. I'm not quite finished with the text. And then I want to show you a number of things from the text. (laughs) I couldn't help but think as you came in this morning with uh, Thanksgiving uh, out here in the coming week. And and then um, Advent season coming up. The series is going to be on the the kings, and um, uh, so uh, the kings of Christmas and the Advent season. And here we are singing, Christ the Lord is risen today, and all these resurrection hymns, and you're sitting here, man, this is a little confusing. Um, And uh, well, let me even confuse you that much more. Uh, When you start singing those Advent Advent songs about the birth of Christ, and you're thinking uh, that resurrection hymns only belong at the time of the... uh, at the time of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ when we celebrate uh, Holy Week, as you uh, think your way through that and all of our triggers are pulled and, and the way we think in those moments like that, well, I'm going to just take you to a good Christmas hymn. Um, Mild he lays his glory by, born that man may no, may no more die, born to give the sons of earth a born, I'm sorry, born to raise the sons of, born to what? Raise the sons of earth, born to give us second birth. Yes, Jesus came to destroy His enemies, and those enemies are sin, which He takes away from us. Those enemies are death and the grave, which He conquered for us. And those enemies are eternal judgment, which He has borne for us, so that we have eternal life in Him. And the Apostles' Creed pulls all those together right here for us. Now, I know we haven't been here for a while, and I'm not going to over-review because I really don't have time to. <clears throat> but I want to remind you, let me put it this way. If you had been living in the first century, and if the biblical um, data 
of the Apostles' Creed, that is, all that the Apostles by the Spirit of God has revealed that is put into this uh, summation. Remember the creed. Remember what a creed is for, whether it's one that's in the Bible or one that is based on the Bible. A creed has three purposes. It's used in worship. It is used to protect the church in the purity of its doctrine as a confessional statement. And it is used for discipleship, to teach us basic Christianity. In fact, I have this kind of hope in my heart and life that no longer will I, when somebody asks you, what is the gospel, no longer will you call me up and say, Pastor, what's a good book? When they say that to you, you say, oh, well, I can t- here, I can help you. Here's the gospel. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried. And not only was He dead and buried, but His soul in His death, His body was buried. His soul descended to Hades, that section called paradise, and even as He told the thief on the cross. But just as you confessed earlier from Psalm 16 uh, this morning in our preparation at 755, that, that, that was a good time to be here. And then we started into that, and then it said what? Your body will not be left to corruption, nor your soul in Hades. And so he was brought forth, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And then he stops in that here is this 100-word in Latin, this 100-word confession, and 75, three-fourths of it deal with who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Not what he taught, but who he is and what he did. That's how we're saved, because of who he is and what he did did, the one sent from the Father Almighty. And now when it gets to his, now it goes from his humiliation back to his exaltation and his ascension and his promised return, then it stopped because from the heavens, what does he do? He pours forth his Spirit. So now you go to the third section of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And now we see, I don't mean this irreverently, then we see the work product of the Holy Spirit in light of the work victories of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. What is the work product of the Holy Spirit as he applies what Christ has accomplished? What is that work product? Well, that work product is the Holy Catholic Church. There is the perfect church of the elect in the heavens, triumphant. Then I believe in the communion of the saints. There is the imperfect church militant on the earth in communion on mission, on message, in ministry, as it militantly, it with fighting the spiritual battles in light of the victories of Christ, is advancing the mission of making disciples with the message of the whole counsel of God contoured and connected by the gospel of saving grace in Christ to all the world to bring forth all of the elect from every tribe and tongue with evangelism and enfolding and discipling and worship. And as that is being done, And then when that has been done, Jesus returns. And so here is this glorious work product, the Holy Catholic Church being gathered together by the communion of the saints, the church militant, bringing forth the church triumphant. I just this week, we had one one from our midst go to the church triumphant uh, that uh, we we celebrated his home going. And that, and how, and you see the church militant was doing its work from a sovereign Savior filled with the Spirit and gathering and perfecting the saints through the powerful work of discipleship and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, then they are brought into glory as they now now enjoy.
joy, the presence of the Lord. But what all will this gospel blessing do? Now watch. The work product of the Holy Spirit moves from the church, triumphant and militant, to the individual believers who are making this confession, I believe. And three, inseparable. In fact, it was in every song we sung today and every text we read today. These three gospel truths that the Holy Spirit affirms from the Word of God to all who know Christ. The the glorious three truths. The forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. And you can't get life everlasting without the resurrection of the body. Who gets the resurrection of the body to life everlasting? Now listen to me. Everybody gets a resurrection of the body. All will be resurrected, but not all to life eternal. Some unto death unending. It's called hell. Some unto life eternal in a new heavens and a new earth with the Savior. Who has the resurrection of the body unto life eternal? Those who know Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Those are the ones who have it. And you see how this creed is wonderfully constructed, not only in its Trinitarian form, but when it gets to the work of the Holy Spirit in light of the finished work of Christ and how Christ is finishing his work through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to gather his, his triumphant church, elect and perfect forever, through his militant church, celebrating them on mission, on message, and ministry with the communion of the saints. And then as believers are brought to Christ, what gospel truths does he name? for them. You're forgiven of your sins. You are not only forgiven of your sins, you have in fact, um, you have in fact the promise of the resurrection of the body and then the life eternal. You know, that's very similar for me. I, I look back at the trajectory of my Christian life and I see how all three of those have been at work in my life. I remember when I was converted at age 20 and came to Christ. And when I came to Christ, my life was so emptied by sin. Not, please hear what I said. It wasn't just empty. It had been emptied by my sin. Sin was devastating and destroying. It provided nothing. It was vanity and emptiness. Oh, moments of exhilaration that gave way to despair every single time. And then I came to Christ. Now meaning. Now life. Now joy. Now fullness. And it's because I'm forgiven of my sin. All of my sins, guilt, and shame has been taken away. Don't you love that glorious word from the Scriptures? Remission. Remission. Forgiveness comes because of remission. Now, would you do me a favor if you take notes, or maybe even if you don't take notes, take this note. Write remission. And as you write remission, look at it. Do you see a word in remission? This isn't hard. East Carolina can get this one. You ready? Mission. What's what's mission? Sent on a task. What is remission of sins? Sins sent away. Sins sent away. The picture in the Old Testament was using two animals, a goat and a lamb on the Day of Atonement. The goat expiation 
had the sins laid upon him, and he went outside the camp to take our sins away, the sins of the people away. And then the lamb was slain to make the payment for the sins because every, the God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The, the soul that sinneth shall die. Either I die or someone dies in my place. And God put this theater of drama of, re, of redemption and remission right in front of us every single year. And then comes Christ who t- goes to Calvary outside the walls. And he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sins away. Expiation. And then as the lamb, he made the sacrificial payment. How many of you have ever gotten a bill in the mail? You ever got a bill in the mail? And when you got the bill in the mail, that means you owe something. And then many times the bill in the mail has a little envelope in it. And what does it say on the envelope? Remit your payment to this address. And when you remit your payment, then you have remission of your debt. That's exactly what happened. Jesus goes to the cross. He becomes our sin. He pays for our sin. And when he pays for all the sins of his people as, and then declares it is finished. In other words, at the cross, Jesus sent our payment in. Tetelestai. It's finished. Therefore, we now have remission of our sins. I praise God for that. The second thing in my journey of my Christian life became the awareness that not only had I purpose and meaning and joy in that life, even in a broken world, and that was rooted in my forgiveness that all my sins... (laughs) have been taken away from me. Not only has it been, not only did I realize that, but a third thing, I increasingly realize in my Christian life, the best is yet to come. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting, not by faith, but by sight with a new body for the new heavens and the new earth. And no pain, no sorrow, no grief, no tears. Only the presence and joy of the Lord. See the three work together. Everlasting life with a resurrected body For who? Those who are forgiven of their sins because they're in Christ. And Christ is in them. Now I want you to, I just want to stop right here. There's a couple of things I want to share with you this morning. But before I go any further, I want to ask you something. I want you, please, if you have never come to Christ and given your life to him, surrendered. I didn't say negotiate. I didn't say come to Jesus. Jesus, I'd like to get the new body and the everlasting life, but I'm going to keep this life for me now. No, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. It's repent and believe. Turn from your sins and yourself and put your trust in Jesus alone. And that, every, that now I am yours and you are mine. If you will not do that, if you have not done that, I beg you to come and tell me why. I beg you. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Forget business. Even marriage for a minute. Forget all of those things that we think are important decisions. They are all downstream from this one. This is the crucial decision of your life. What say ye of Christ? And you don't have a third option. 
He, he either is Lord and Savior, or you have said, no, it's all about me. I'll be my own Savior. I'll be my own Lord. Then there is no forgiveness of sins. There will be a resurrection of the body, but it won't be to life everlasting. It will be to judgment forever. Unending, unendurable, yet unfathomable. What about this resurrection of the body? How many of you have ever been able to find a hymn on the resurrection of the body? I've only found one. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to quote it in just a minute at the end. I've only been able to find one hymn on the resurrection of the body. Now, let me make clear. What we have here, what we have here is not a... um, So I've I've kind of walked you through the context of the Apostles' Creed, but what we have here in the text that supports it in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, what we have here is what we're talking about immediately is the resurrection of our bodies. I believe in the resurrection of the body. That's not referring to Jesus. We've already covered that, remember? On the third day, he rose again. This is talking about believers, the resurrection of the body of a believer, I mean, all you got to do is just step back and look at the scope of time. Here is biblical religion rooted in the Old Testament with progressive clarity into the New Testament, right? And how do they handle the death of believers? With care and reverence. How do man-made religions handle it? Man-made religions either worship the body or seek to be delivered from the body. That's why some of them attempt to embalm it, keep it, because I want it. This life, I'm trying, I mean, you live in a society that is absorbed with the fact that somehow they're out there somewhere, there's got to be a shot or a pill or a diet or a gym that I can go to and I'll never age. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. I'm going to tell you. Gravity works. I mean, you're, you're sagging. You're, I, I mean, you can add what you want to, tuck what you want to, nip what you want to, but it's going down, and finally gravity wins. It pulls you six feet under, okay? It, that, it's going to win. I can promise you that if Jesus doesn't come back first. So, but we are in, body, some people are in body worship. Some people are in body hatred, and that, and that was the dominant theme when the gospel went out in the first century. If we had had the Apostles' Creed in the first century, nobody would have, and I said, let's say we had the Apostles' Creed in the first century, and Harry Reader lived in the first century. So I'm going to do a series on the Apostles' Creed, and the year was 45 AD, okay? I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a, a see, nobody would have come up and said, what's this Holy Catholic Church? Nobody would have come up and said, what do you mean descended into Hades, descended into hell? That question wouldn't have been asked. Those, wouldn't have, those are our questions when we go through it. Let me tell you the one that would have been asked. What do you mean resurrection of the body? They despised it. That's why they burn bodies when they die. They don't lay them aside with reverence. Why do believers lay aside with reverence? Because there are two things. We know that when God made the body, it was good. Body's not evil. But over here is a whole philosophy that says the physical is evil and the spiritual is good. The whole point of salvation is to escape the body, get rid of the body. Get, I need to get rid of it, so burn it when I die. It's nothing. But the believer, historically, just watched the way they dealt with the body. They didn't worship it like the Egyptians, nor did they despise it like the Greeks. They set it aside with the expectation of the resurrection that when Jesus saves you, he's just like he, soul and body, came forth, you will come forth. You've already been born again spiritually. 
And the soul perfected will be joined with the body perfected, and you'll be soul and body for all eternity. He was born not only to give the sons of earth a second birth, but he was born to raise the sons of earth from death. A new body for the new heavens and the new earth. So when somebody dies, if they die young, they're not going to be that age forever. If they die old, they're not going to be that age forever. They're going to be, Harry, what age are they going to be? <laughs> that is a great question. I will tell you this. However it is that Jesus is raised, and however it is, he's recognizable, they know who he is, but somehow our bodies will be that sense. But they will be vibrant. They will be, you'll probably be able to say this, I hadn't felt this good since I don't know when. <laughs> and you'll be right. You will not, it will be a glorious body that is given un, in, untainted by the, and uh, untainted by sin. And that's what we realize. See, when God made the body, it was good. When he made Adam's body, he was what? It was good, right? And then he breathed in the breath of life. Well, you will be with the Lord in the intermediate state, perfected in the breath of life. But instead of like Adam at creation, where the breath of life was put into his body already created, yours will be raised, renewed, and transformed, and joined to that perfected soul for, a new heaven, for the new heavens and the new earth. And how do we know this? How do we know? And listen, all three of these have got to work together. How do I know I've got forgiveness of sins? How do I know I'll have be resurrected body? How do I know I have life evermore? Here's how you know. Do not look to your feelings. Look to Jesus. That's what Paul is doing in this text. You see, Corinth would not have said, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Corinth was a suburb underneath Athens. And, and Athens was a place where the apostle Paul will, uh, goes and preaches. It's in Acts chapter 17. And it says he's up on Mars Hill. And he's preaching away about Jesus, his saving grace, and his resurrection. And that all believers will be resurrected with him. And when he gets to the resurrection, it says they mocked him. They scorned him. Anybody that tells you, listen, the celebration of the resurrection of Christ and the gospel truth that we preach that we will all be raised in Christ, that's just wish fulfillment. Take them back to the first century. Nobody wished it. They're not creating a doctrine that everybody wants, which is an everlasting life in this body. On the contrary, that's the last thing they want. Their point, salvation, was escape from the body, deliverance from the body, eradication of the body, which, by the way, is another lesson. Here we are preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world, and we want to know what does the culture want to hear, and we start shaping the message. The, the apostles brought the message the Bible revealed, not the one the culture wanted. If, you wanted. if you wanted to get a crowd together to listen to you preach, the last thing you would have said in Athens is the resurrection of the body. But Paul preached the whole counsel of God as revealed in his word, not as requested by the audience. Yes, he spoke in terms the audience would understand but he didn't speak on the terms that the audience wanted. He spoke on what God revealed. I'm innocent of the blood of all men, for I declared to you the whole counsel of God. And that included something they despise. And that is the atoning death of Christ and the resurrection of the body. 
and therefore the forgiveness of sins in the res- In other words, folks, listen to me. You can't have forgiveness of sins without the atoning death of Christ. And you can't have a resurrection of our body without the resurrection of Christ's body. He says, how, how is it that some of you, I said and preached to you that on the third day Christ arose. And now you say at Corinth, you don't believe in the resurrection of the body? How can you say that? Because if your body's not raised, that means that Christ was not raised. And what he's doing is reverse logic. You see, because Christ is raised, your body will be raised. So he says, if you don't believe that your body is raised, then you're saying Christ wasn't raised. And if Christ isn't raised, then you're still in your sins. There is no forgiveness. And so he lays it out before them. Now, and if, by the way, and if special revelation's not enough, he goes to general revelation. Would you take your Bibles and read something else with me, and then I'll give you the takeaway? Look with me in 1 Corinthians 15 again, right where I, well, go down to verse uh, Go down to verse uh, 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. (laughs) By the way, that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty powerful language because, I mean, Jesus said, you remember what Jesus said about don't call people fools without cause? I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty powerful language, isn't it? You foolish person, what, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that it is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For all flesh is not the, uh, for not all flesh is the same, but there is some, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one is one kind, the glory of the earthly is of another, and there is a gl- one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. So you know your body will never perish, the new body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And that doesn't mean a non-corporeal body. It just means a spiritual body that is not governed by the limitations of a natural body. For uh, there, is, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Isn't that interesting? The first Adam, second Adam. Christ and Adam. Adam, of course, brought our sin and therefore brought us death. Jesus is the one who brings us life. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. So what do you have first? You have Adam formed from the dust, and then breath is put into him. Spirit is put into him. But Jesus, who is spirit, comes and reverses the project process and takes upon himself a body. As with the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So I've got a body after Adam, but I'll have a new body after the second Adam, who is Christ. You see, what Adam did, I did. So I get what Adam did. What Jesus did, the second Adam, the second man. See, isn't it interesting? Is Jesus the second man? Who's the first man? Is Jesus the second man? I mean, why isn't he the 383rd million man? Because he is not the second man simply as Homo sapiens. He is the second man in terms of appointment as a federal head. You had one federal head, and what Adam did, we did. Now you got a second Adam, Christ, and what he did, we did. My favorite illustration is Neil Armstrong. (laughs) Some of you don't know this, but uh, we landed on the moon. 
Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I just said? What did I just say? We landed on the moon. Harry, when did you go there? When Neil Armstrong went there. When Neil Armstrong came out and put that flag down, every American landed there. And then he broadened it. Well, before that, he broadened it. When he landed on the moon's surface, he said, one small step for a man. One giant leap for mankind. And I don't care who you talk to. Here's what you'd hear people say. Not Neil Armstrong's on the moon. Here's what you'd heard him say. Did you know we've landed on the moon? We've landed on the moon. When Jesus bore my sins, they're gone. When Jesus came out of that grave, I am raised. My resurrection is assured. He, he is the first fruits. Those who are his are the harvest. And what are we raised to? Eternal life with the ascended Christ. So that is what he, so let me give you, uh, well, I got to read you, I got to read you this last part. Isn't this great? I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you, a mystery, we shall not all sleep. That is, not everybody's going to die. That's the biblical term for the death of a believer. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound when the dead will be raised into it will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on the Im the immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written: Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of sin, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us all the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, get to work. <laughs> Just get to work. You don't have to worry about your standing before God. You're forgiven. You don't have to worry about your future. You're going to get a new body for a new heavens and a new earth. That's tied to Jesus. And when Jesus died for your sins in his atoning death, you're forgiven. When Jesus came out of that grave, your resurrection is assured. And when Jesus ascended, he sends forth the Spirit who will bring you to life eternal evermore in Christ. So here's your takeaway. Isn't it interesting how he uses special revelation to teach us of the resurrection of our body tied to the resurrection of Christ as revealed throughout Scripture? Then he goes to general revelation. He uses astronomy. He uses agriculture. He uses botany. He uses biology. He goes to general revelation to show you this whole thing's already been pictured for you. Falls in, dies, look what comes up. There, look at the stars, look at the seed, look, it just takes you to lesson after lesson in general revelation. Well, here's your, here's your, here's your closing statement. Christians do not believe we are saved for our bodies, the idolatry of body, nor from our bodies, the denial of the fullness of God's redeeming work of soul and body, but we are saved from our sins to our resurrected bodies for life everlasting. I believe in the remission of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection body, and the life everlasting. I have people come to me all the time, Pastor, I just, I just, I don't feel forgiven. I don't feel forgiven. My friend, I understand it. I understand what you're saying, but here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're in Christ by faith and repentance, you are forgiven. We just had something called Reformation Sunday. And what was the foundational truth? The Scripture alone is our only rule of faith and practice. 
I'll never forget hearing R.C. said this. He said, you know, sometimes I'm, I can't break through to people who say, I just feel guilty, I feel guilty, I feel guilty. And he said, then I call you to repent this. No, no, you don't understand, R.C. I have repented. I did repent. I repented of my sins. I just don't, I'm, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm free. I, I just feel guilty. And he said, no, no, I'm not telling you to repent conversion. I'm taking you at your word. You've repented. I'm telling you to repent now because you just said your feelings are your final authority of faith and practice instead of God's word. God's word says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God's word says that Jesus said, Tetelestai, I sent the payment in that sends your sins away. God's word says Jesus is risen. And so will all of his people. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Don't you love it? To the intermediate state, we're all going to be with Jesus in paradise one by one, aren't we? But on that day, we'll all come at once with a new body for the new heavens and the new, and the new earth. Jesus' body lay in that grave for three days, and then he came forth. And that assures that all who are in Christ will also come forth. Can I read you this? Here's what you come forth to. Please let me just do it. I'm going to be a minute or so late here. That's the only hymn I could find, but I love this hymn. One of my favorite hymn writers, Margaret Clarks, and I finally found it. In resurrection bodies like Jesus' very own, we'll rise to meet our Savior with joy around his throne. We'll marvel at the mercy that bids poor sinners come. He welcomes us at his table to share his heavenly home. A joy of resurrection, all sin and sorrow pass. To see the face of Jesus, to be like him at last. Made perfect in his image, complete in Christ the Son. In resurrection glory, we'll share the life he won. O resurrection body set free from pain and death, sin's curse forever vanquished by Christ's victorious breath. Lord, teach us in our trials your hidden ways to trace, to walk by faith discerning the mysteries of grace. O resurrection body, young, radiant, vibrant, free, with powers unthought, undreamed of, how rich our joys will be. Through endless years to marvel, design, create, and explore, in resurrection wonder, to worship, serve, and adore. With holy joy, Lord Jesus, we sing the life you give, the hope you hold before us, the strength by which we live. Lead on in sovereign mercy through all earth's troubled ways till resurrected bodies will be used to bring to him resurrection praise. What a glorious anticipation is ours in Christ forevermore. He's won the victory. Because he died, your sins are forgiven. Because he is raised, so will you, to life evermore when he comes again for you. Are you his? Have you turned and put your trust in him? No greater decision is before you. Here's Jesus. What say you? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. We know what you say. You have said abundantly and gloriously, there is no condemnation. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Truly, truly, he who believes in me has eternal life. Our sins are forgiven, and you have promised that though we die, we shall live with a new body for a new heavens and a new earth. Father, I thank you for your glorious 
revealed promises, secured and assured in Christ. So now, Father, I pray that all of this, those here who are sensitive to their sins but are looking to feelings for assurance, today they'll look to Jesus. For those who have no assurance because they haven't come to Christ, today they will come to Christ, giving their lives to Him. And if you want to talk with someone, please let me know. We will love to talk and pray with you. I invite you to Jesus today. Father, thank you for the anticipation of life evermore with resurrection bodies to sing and live with resurrection praise. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.